Life is difficult. Would everybody agree with that? It's not easy. Life is difficult. It just doesn't come uh, you know, handed to you on a platter. And so we ask this question, why is life so hard? Why is there suffering in the world? Now friends, that's one of the most important questions you'll ever ask in life. It's been asked by thousands, millions of people, and it was actually asked thousands of years ago by a guy named Job. In Job chapter seven, verse one, he says this. Why is life so hard? Why, why is life so hard? And why do we suffer? I want us to look at the reason, the results, and the right response to the difficulties you face in life. Now, I want to begin by first looking at the cause, the reason. Why is it so difficult to live on this planet? You might write this down. The Bible says, rebellion against God broke everything. Now, it all started back with the first couple, Adam and Eve, in the Garden of Eden. When God created the world, everything was perfect. It was paradise. But one day Adam and Eve decided that they wanted to do what they wanted to do. Now God had said, you can do everything you want to do in paradise, but just one thing. That's the minimum temptation possible. He said, you can do anything you want to in this paradise, except one thing. What does man and woman do? Immediately do the one thing God says don't do. Now why did he even give them a choice? Because without a choice, they can't choose to love God. If, you have to, if you're forced to love God, if you have no choice, then it's not real love. Adam and Eve said, we know better. We know what'll make us happy. We're gonna do what we wanna do. We wanna be gods. And they chose to do the one thing God said, don't do. And the Bible says this, Romans chapter five. Sin came into the world because of what one man did. And with sin came death. Before sin, there was no death in the world. There was no sadness in the world. There was no sorrow. There was no difficulty in the world. People would not die. Adam and Eve could have lived forever as long as it was a perfect environment. It was only when everything got broken that sin brought death into the world. Now, not only did Adam and Eve make that choice, I've made it, and you've made it, and everybody else in the world has made it. We have all said, I don't want to do the right thing. I want to do the easy thing. And the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 53, all of us, all of us have strayed away like sheep. We have left God's path to follow our own paths. And that means we've all done our own thing. We've all said many times in our lives, God, I'm gonna do what I wanna do, even though I know what you've said to do is the right thing, I don't wanna do the right thing, I wanna do what I wanna do. And the Bible says in Proverbs 20, verse nine, the next verse, no one can say I'm innocent. I've never done anything wrong. Anytime God tells you to do something and you don't do it, you're actually in a war with God because God created you to do certain things. When you say, no, I don't think so, I don't think so. It's like a little kid telling his friend, I don't think so. I'm gonna do what I, I know mommy told me to do this. I know daddy told me this. I don't think so. That's called rebellion. Now, I don't wanna go too detailed into this, but there are three kinds of rebellion, and you need to know this so you know these terms, because one of them is real familiar, but the other two aren't familiar to you. There are three kinds of ways that we rebel against God. Would you write these down? The first one, you know this one, it's called sin, sin. Now that's a very common term, sin. What's the middle letter of the word sin? And that's what sin is all about. I want what I want, and I want it now, and I'm gonna be the center of my own life. I am in charge. Sin is all about I, me, myself, and I. But actually, the word sin means to fall short. It means to miss the mark. It's actually an archery term. It comes from like shooting a bow and arrow. Sin is actually an archery term. If you were to set up a, a bullseye uh, here on this stage and you had a bow and arrow and you were to aim for the bullseye and you shoot the arrow and if that arrow didn't have enough energy and it fell short in archery, that's called a sin. It means you missed the mark. It means you fell short. It means you didn't reach the goal. And sin means I don't measure up 
to God's perfect goal for me. I miss the mark, I fall short, I don't quite make it, I'm not perfect, I'm inadequate to make perfection in my life, I fall short. Yesterday afternoon I was watching one of my favorite shows on TV, the old Robin Hood reruns. And I've watched them a dozen times and there's one episode where the uh, sheriff of Nottingham decides he's gonna smoke out Robin Hood to capture him by planning a archery competition because he knows Robin Hood's the best archer in the land and he cannot not show up at a competition. So he plans this competition, Robin Hood shows up dressed in disguise, of course everybody knows who Robin Hood is except the king who's kind of blind. And um, Robin Hood gets up and he starts shooting and he pulls his bow and arrow and he shoots and it hits the target, bullseye, dead on. Then he pulls out another arrow and he shoots it again and that arrow splits the arrow in the bullseye. Nice story, but you've never done that with your life <laughs> and neither have I. We all fall short and we don't make it to the standard of perfection. Now that's called sin. Now there's a second word that you're probably not familiar with, but it's just as important, and it's called transgression. Would you write that word down, transgression? Now a transgression is the exact opposite of a sin. It doesn't mean you fall short, it means you go too far. It means you go past the boundary. You break the law. It is an intentional, deliberate disobedience. Sin can be, I just didn't measure up. I wasn't good enough, I wasn't perfect. But, but transgression means I intentionally break the law. I go past the boundary. If I'm driving down the freeway and the speed limit says 55 miles an hour and I'm going 85, that is not a sin, that's a transgression. Because I'm breaking the law intentionally. You see what I'm saying? It's not like I'm not measuring up. Not that I fall short, it's that I'm breaking the law. I'm going, I know it's the law, but I'm still gonna go 85 anyway. That's called a transgression. And you go deliberate disobedience, willful defiance, breaking God's laws. Now there's a third word, and I want you to get this one, and it's called iniquity. Iniquity. Now this one's not used at all in English today, but iniquity means intention to hurt. Intention to hurt somebody, intention to damage, intention to do evil. Uh, maybe because you're mad or you're jealous or you're envious or you're bitter or you're prideful or somebody's offended you, you wanna hurt them back. That's not a sin, that's not a transgression, that's an iniquity. It is an intentional desire to hurt somebody else. When Hitler and the Nazis killed six million Jewish people in the death camps. That was not a sin, that was not a transgression, that was an iniquity. They intended intentionally to hurt those people. They wanted to kill them. They wanted to eradicate that entire race. And that was evil, that was iniquity. It wasn't measuring, not just measure enough. It was, it was intentionally meant to hurt, caused by anger, resentment, envy, hatred, bitterness, whatever. Let me explain these three in football terms. We're back, almost back into football season again. A lot of the teams, NFL teams, won't go to camp this week. If I'm in football and I wanna know the difference between a sin, a transgression, and an iniquity, a sin would be kicking a field goal and it misses. It falls short. Or it hits the goal post and it goes over to the side. That is a sin would be I have missed the mark. I fell short, kicking a goal and I don't make the field goal. That's I've missed the mark. A transgression would be offsides. If I jump offsides before the snap is taken in football, I intentionally was going after to get you and I'm out of bounds, I'm offside. If I go out of bounds with the ball and I step out of bounds, that's not a sin, that's a transgression. Does that make sense? I've gone out of bounds, I've broken, the law says you stay within these boundaries if you're playing football, but I'm gonna go out of bounds and that's called a transgression. Now, if I come up and I headbutt you and I kick you in the face and I break your thing, that's a personal foul, that's an iniquity. I want to intentionally hurt you, I wanna take you out of the game. Jesus once told three stories in Luke chapter 15. The parable, the story of the lost sheep, 
the story of the lost coin and the story of the lost son or the prodigal son. Each of those stories explains one of the three kinds of rebellion. Sin, transgression, iniquity. Now David in Psalm 32 talks about all three of them. In fact, here's what he says. Look here on the screen and it's on your outline. I acknowledge my sin, circle that, to you. I did not cover up my iniquity, circle that, and I confessed my transgressions, circle that, and you forgave my guilt. He says, you know, it really doesn't matter which one it was, whether I didn't measure up or I missed the mark or I went out of bounds or I intentionally meant to hurt somebody, you're still gonna forgive me if I confess it to you. So why is life so hard? And why do we suffer? Why is everything a battle? Well, the answer is rebellion against God broke everything. That's the reason. Now, what's the result? What's the damage? Well, the damage, friends, is significant because it's in every single area of your life. You might write this down. Nothing works perfectly. Because I have made poor choices, you have made poor choices, the entire human race has made poor choices, everything's broken, and nothing on this planet works perfectly perfectly. Sin has damaged everything. Sin has ruined everything. Sin has destroyed everything. Sin has corrupted and spoiled everything. Sin has injured everything. Every relationship, every idea, every dream, every human body, everything has been touched by this damage. Do you want to be happier, healthier, and more resistant to stress? Then you need to develop an attitude of gratitude. In fact, the Bible says we're to rejoice always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances. But it can be difficult to feel grateful. So to help you, Pastor Rick hand-selected 52 verses to bolster your sense of gratitude and increase your happiness. This set of beautifully designed cards will help you memorize scripture so you can recall God's word when you need it most. You can also use them to minister to others. Give one to a friend and write a personalized note of encouragement on the back. If a scripture really speaks to you, frame it. Put them in places where you can read them during the day for encouragement. And today, when you give a gift to help Daily Hope take the hope of Jesus to a world in need, we'll send you the Gratitude Scripture card set to say thanks. Now, the Bible is very specific, and it mentions six dimensions of your life where sin has damaged stuff in your life, and it's not perfect. And if you expect it to be perfect, you're going to be severely disappointed. These six areas or dimensions of your life uh, are talked about intensively in a book called Ecclesiastes. Now Solomon was the wisest man who ever lived. He was the wealthiest man who ever lived. And at one point he was the king of Israel. And Solomon wrote three books of wisdom, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Songs of Solomon. They're in the middle of the Bible. In Ecclesiastes, one of these books, he mentions six dimensions of life that are damaged on our broken planet. Let's look at them real quickly. The first result, the first damage, is natural disasters and deformities. The world has natural disasters and deformities, not because that's what God wants, because that's what sin does in the world. The environment has suffered from human sin and human poor choices. And we're on a broken planet. It's not perfect anymore. We're not living in Eden anymore. As John Milton wrote a very famous poem, paradise was lost. We don't live in paradise. We live on a broken planet. And as a result, we have hurricanes and typhoons and wacky weather and earthquakes and all ki- and droughts and floods, and you know, it's amazing to me that insurance calls all these things acts of God, but doesn't call the birth of a baby an act of God. In other words, an act of God is only the negative stuff that happens. 
God does not want these things happening in the world. The world was broken when sin damaged everything. And so now we have all of these natural disasters happening all around us. And God is as upset by them as, as we are. The Bible says in Romans 8, 20, creation was condemned to lose its purpose. Everything on this planet has lost its original purpose. And that's why we have to get it back. It has to be restored. In the CEV version, it says creation is confused. You know, when you look and you see the birth of, for instance, a, a pair of Siamese twins who are joined at the head, that's confusing. And you go, what was God thinking there? That wasn't what God wanted. That's what God never planned. That's the result because everything in the world is damaged, including your DNA, your parents' DNA, their parents' DNA, and everything else. Have you figured this out? Your body doesn't work right? Doesn't work, per that, if, if everybody's body worked perfectly, there would be no need for doctors. And so we have defects and disabilities in animals and in people. There are emotional disabilities, there are mental disabilities, there are physical disabilities. Every one of us have defective parts of our mind, our bodies, and our spirits because sin has broken everything. Creation is confused. And you go, why do animals do that? Because creation is confused. And why is there that kind of deformity and defect? Because creation is confused. Romans 8, says, all of creation groans with pain. You know what that means? It means that the earth needs salvation, not just people. The environment needs to be saved, not just people, because it's all been damaged by poor decisions and rebellion against God. Number two, the second damage that it's done is physical decay and death. Physical decay and death. Now, there was no death on this planet until sin entered the world. There was no decay on this planet until sin entered the world. It was perfect. It was paradise. But now, because sin has entered the world, there is decay and death. And Ecclesiastes chapter 8 says, no one can control the wind or stop his own death. Now, we know that death is inevitable, but we sure try to stop it. And we go to great lengths to postpone the decay, too. Oil of Olay. <laughs> Lotions and potions and makeup and Botox and surgeries. What are we trying to do? To delay the decay. That's what we're trying to do. Delay the decay. Now, you're gonna die one day, I'm sorry. You're gonna, but actually, I'll tell you in a minute why that's good news, because you don't wanna live on an imperfect planet. But in the meantime, I hate to tell you this, you are declining, okay? You are declining, it's called aging. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter four, our physical body is becoming older and weaker. Would any of you like to give a testimony on this verse? <laughs> a personal life experience. The, the, the fact is, you know, at, over time, parts of your body start to sag. Many of us men, we get furniture problems. Our chest drops into our drawers. <laughs> Many of you, your, your teeth shine like stars. They come out at night. Okay, now, here's how you know if you're aging, if you're getting older. When you have to bend over to pick something up, you go, is there anything else I can do while I'm down here? <laughs> you, you don't want to waste the effort, okay? Okay. Now, the truth is, we all are aging. By the way, guys, I'll just give you a little tip as a husband. When a woman tells you her age, always, always act surprised. Okay. Wow. Just a little tip. Give you, give you a little good help. And by the way, for you guys, when you uh, men, don't tell people you're over the hill. Say, I'm playing the back nine. Okay, that, that's what you're doing. I'm just playing the back nine, all right? That's, that's what I'm doing. Now, Solomon is so brutally honest about decay and death and how we are all aging. Uh, it's actually comical. Let me read you this passage out of Ecclesiastes here on the screen. He's defining aging. He says, your limbs will tremble with age and your strong legs will grow weak. 
your teeth will be too few to do their work. (laughs) And you'll be blind too. And when your teeth are gone, keep your lips tightly closed when you eat. (laughs) Just let advice for those of you living in rest homes, all right? Okay, now, even the chirping of birds will wake you up. It just, it all irritates you. You're so sensitive and, you know, you can't get to sleep. But you yourself will be deaf and tuneless with a quavering voice. And then it says, you'll be white-haired and withered, dragging along without any sexual desire. You'll be standing at death's door, and as you near your everlasting home, the mourners will walk along the streets. Thank you, everybody. That's the end of my sermon today. God bless you. (laughs) Glad you came. Hope that was a real inspiration, really cheered you up for the week. Okay, really gave you a lot of input. You feel good, go home. God bless you. No. Now, why is all that happening? Because sin broke everything, including your DNA. You know, I read this week in the newspaper, uh, it was a big article that said, scientists have now concluded that the universe had a beginning and will have an end. (laughs) Duh. Actually, did you know that for about 150 years, we didn't believe that? You know, science is often wrong. And and for 150 years, scientists actually thought the universe was eternal, that it had always existed, and that the universe will always exist in the future. We now know from Einstein's theories and, uh, you know, E equals MC squared and all these other things, that the universe had a beginning and will definitely have an end. Well, anybody who reads the Bible knows that. I mean, they call it the Big Bang, but wherever you got a Big Bang, you've got a Big Banger. (laughs) Okay? Nobody, no scientist believes in spontaneous generation. The stuff just happens out of nothing. That we're just sitting here and in a million years, all of a sudden, a watch is going to show up. I mean, Pasteur uh, exploded that myth in 1865 and proved that spontaneous generation does not happen, that things just don't happen out of nothing. There is a cause behind that. Now, in physics, this is called uh, the law of entropy. Let me show you a, 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 a phrase here, or an equation here on the screen. Everybody's heard of E equals MC squared. You know what this is? Delta S equals Q slash T. You know, Q being heat, heat absorbed, and T being the, the temperature of the surrounding. This is the second law of thermodynamics. It is not a theory, it is a law. And the second law of uh, thermodynamics is the law of entropy that explains that everything in the universe is irreversibly decaying, decaying into disorder. That energy seeks its simplest state, it always does. It doesn't get more complex. Energy always looks for the simplest state. So that means matter is always degrading and that energy is always dispersing. Chemicals do not naturally become more complex. Chemicals, by their nature, tend to break down into smaller and smaller elements. Energy, by its nature, does not tend to become more complex. Energy, by its nature, tends to fizzle out and seek its lowest. We know that all of the stars are burning out. We know that the sun is burning out. This is the law of entropy, the second law of thermodynamics. That things do not improve, they are decaying. Things do not get more complex, they get simpler. It is not a theory, it is a law. Every physicist knows the law, of, the second law of thermodynamics. Now there's one problem with it. You can't believe in the law of thermodynamics and believe in evolution. Because evolution says the exact opposite. Evolution says that chemicals naturally, left on their own, will become more complex and that energy on its own will become more complex. When everything in the universe says the exact opposite, energy is declining, matter is decaying. That's not a theory. That's a law. That's the equation I just put on the scripture, and every physicist knows that. And so you really have to live with a dual alignment to believe in the second law of thermodynamics and be an evolutionist, because they do not match. They are...
self-contradictory. 1 Corinthians 15, 22 says this, everyone dies because all of us are related to Adam, the first man. Now, that's the bad news, but actually there's some good news in this. I'm glad I'm not gonna live forever on this planet because to live on this planet, to have to live on this planet forever with rape and molestation and, and corruption and sin and sorrow and sadness and grief and power plays and people misusing each other and abusing each other, that to me would be hell. And God doesn't want you to live forever on this planet. He wants you to live forever, but he wants you to live forever in a perfect place, not on a planet that has been broken by sin. Do you want to be happier, healthier, and more resistant to stress? Then you need to develop an attitude of gratitude. In fact, the Bible says we're to rejoice always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances. But it can be difficult to feel grateful. So to Forever lover. Pastor Rick hand-selected 52 verses to bolster your sense of gratitude and increase your happiness. This set of beautifully designed cards will help you memorize scripture so you can recall God's word when you need it most. You can also use them to minister to others. Give one to a friend and write a personalized note of encouragement on the back. If a scripture really speaks to you, frame it. Put them in places where you can read them during the day for encouragement. And today, when you give a gift to help Daily Hope take the hope of Jesus to a world in need, we'll send you the Gratitude Scripture Card Set to say thanks.